what so during this tutorial we will see what instrumentation is and what dynamic binary instrumentation is. Okay. Uh, then we would basically see how to how pin actually does dynamic binary instrumentation and how to use pin for architectural study. So you guys would be using pin for your homework assignments. So please pay attention and if you have any questions please feel free to interrupt me. Okay. So let's start with instrumentation. So instrumentation is a technique for inserting extra code into an application to observe, study and even change its behavior. A uh, lot of program analysis tools use an instrumentation for performance profiling, uh, error detection and capture, to capture and read behavior. Uh, Valgrind uses instrumentation for memory error analysis. It can detect misuse of malloc and free. So by misuse of malloc, I mean that uh, you have allocated some memory segment using malloc and you are not freeing when it's used. In. So it leads to pro uh, memory leaks. So Valgrind can identify those. By misuse of free, I mean that you are freeing some un unallocated memory segment. So it will lead to segmentation points. It can even detect uninitialized variables and dangling pointers. Uh, do you guys know what dangling pointers are? Uh, pointers that are not initialized to uh, dangling pointers uh, actually point to a memory region which has not been allocated by the application. So dereferencing them may lead to segmentation points. Okay. Uh, Intel's inspector is also a, it also uses instrumentation for thread error analysis. It can detect data races in your multi-threaded application and even deadlocks in multi-threaded application. Intel's VTune amplifier also uses instrumentation for performance analysis. It can locate hotspots in your application and it can even do uh, lock weight analysis. So it can give you the lock contention time. Uh, we would be ma mainly using instrumentation for architectural study. Uh, we would be doing processor, branch predictor, and cache simulations using instrumentation tools. Uh, and we would be using instrumentation to collect instruction traces. And these instruction traces would then be fed to some other trace-based simulator, detail simulator. Okay. So Intel software development emulator. Uh, also uses instrumentation to emulate new x86 instruction. Suppose that you want to implement some new x86 instruction and study what benefit you would get because of it. Uh, so, so what you do is that you uh, you register with software development emulator a function which implements the functional behavior of the application. And when software development emulator encounters this new instruction, instead of trying to execute it natively, it will actually call the function that you have registered to emulate its behavior. Okay. So now moving on to instrumentation approaches. So when we are doing instrumentation, the two main questions that arise are where do we want to insert code and what code do we want to insert? So these two questions are mostly related to the problem that you are trying to solve. So if you are doing cache simulation, then on execution of each load store instruction, you would want to look up a cache model that you have developed. So we are so in cache simulation, so we are inserting code at execution of a load store instruction, and the code that we are inserting is to look up a cache model. Okay. Similarly, in the branch predictor performance study, we would want to insert code just before the execution of a branch instruction and it would look up the branch predictor that we have prepared and tell us whether there's a branch miss or a hit. Okay. And the next question that arises is how do we actually go about inserting this code? Uh, there are various approaches to it. Uh, we can directly modify the application source code and we could directly write code, <coughs> add code in it. Okay. Uh, this is called source code instrumentation. It's not, I mean, you must have used it for measuring some time taken by a particular chunk of application. You add code before that chunk to measure the starting time and then at the end of it to measure the end time to get the time that is consumed in that particular chunk. It is not widely used 
Okay, it has suffered some of the major drawbacks. You, because you are doing source code instrumentation, you should have the source code with you. Uh, just uh, modifying, just instrumenting the source code of the application is not sufficient. You would even want to modify the source code of the third party libraries that it is using. Uh, so, why can anybody tell me why would we want to do this? Modify the third party libraries that the application is using. Uh, think about cache simulation. So, you are trying to add, insert code just before it each load store instruction to look up the cache model. So your library functions that you are using may be doing some load store, may be executing some load store instruction. So you would want to insert code to look up the cache model before them also. Okay. So just uh, instrumenting the application source code is not sufficient. You would have to instrument all the libraries that it is using. And this finally it requires recompilation and relinking the application. Uh, the second technique is to do static binary. So just one minute. So can you think of like one? So he has he has talked about the drawback, right? So several ways. Why is it a problem? Does it occur to you that it's a problem? So several And if so, why? Somebody. From most of the commercial applications, we don't have the source code. Right. So. So you have a source code of Microsoft Word, how many has that? How many has that? They want to instrument Microsoft Word, for example. This way. This is pretty good, right? I mean, most commonly used applications are some of these com Windows commercial applications. We don't have the source <coughs> code for them. Okay? So it's difficult to instrument them through source code instrumentation. Okay? Uh, so the second technique is uh, static binary instrumentation. Here, instead, it is similar to source code instrumentation, but instead of modifying the source code, here we directly modify the executable binary file of the application. Uh, it suffers from similar drawbacks. You need to uh, know what is the binary format, uh, and you have to because you have to modify it. So we are trying to insert some extra code in the binary. So what would happen is that. The instruction addresses may change because of this extra code that we added. So now if there is a branch instruction, the branch target, we would even have to change the branch target. So just adding extra code is not in the original has also also needs to be modified. And then <coughs> code discovery is another problem which static binary instrumentation suffers from. The code discovery I mean is that most of the applications that we use, they uh, these days come, uh, they use dynamic libraries. Okay. So the third party libraries that you use, the, 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 bind, the code for the third party library is not there in the uh, application binary. It is loaded when the application is, uh, is loaded at runtime. Okay. So, the, so when you are doing static binary instrumentation, you don't have the code for the uh, third party libraries with you. So here also you would have to actually look for the uh, binaries of these libraries and modify them also. Okay. So here also just modifying the application's binary is not sufficient. The third approach which is most commonly used instrumentation approach is dynamic binary instrumentation. In dynamic binary instrumentation you instrument the application in the third line. As the application is executing, you insert some extra code in it and you execute it along with the application. Okay. It is similar to just-in-time compilation. Okay. So are you guys familiar with just-in-time compilation? Do you know any compiler with Java? JVM. Yeah. Uh, how it works? It changes what? In binary code. Change it to binary code, and then that binary code is compiled wherever you want to execute. No, so that's not just in time. That's just Java compilation. So Java, so when you compile a Java program, it generates bytecode in it. So the class files contain bytecode. Now, when you run this Java program with the Java virtual machine, you write Java and the class name. So when you run it, so Java is the Java virtual machine. So when it starts executing the program, it reads the bytecode from the class files and it generates machine code for it. 
corresponding to it. And then the generated machine code is actually what is executed. Okay? So it keeps on reading machine uh, byte code and generates machine code and then executes it. So this process keeps, keeps on going on until the application ends. So dynamic binary instrumentation is similar to just a type compilation, except here, instead of translating from byte code to machine code, you are translating from machine code to machine code. And while it is doing this translation from machine code to machine code, you have an opportunity to insert some extra code in the application. So while this translation is going on, it adds extra code, and then the generated code is actually, it has the original code, and it has the extra code that you have added, and then it executes it. Okay. So we have to add machine code into machine code. Literally, I don't know machine code. Yeah. I mean, finally, machine code is what runs, so you, know, you would see how it works. Okay. So the benefit of dynamic binary instrumentation is that you do not need to recompile and read in the application. You can, because everything is happening at runtime, you can directly attach your instrumentation tools to a running process. Okay. So most of the tools that you would instrument are like web servers and database servers, which are daemon processes. So you can directly attach to them. And they won't be doing that well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, here the code discovery also becomes much easier because if your application is using some dynamic loaded dynamic load like li uh, dynamically loaded libraries, then the library's code would also be loaded first in the address space. And when it is about to be executed, at that point the instrumentation engine can uh, insert code in it also. So, just like in static binaries, we have to explicitly go and look for third-party libraries and add code. It's not necessary here. And this even takes care of, of self-modifying applications. So, self-modifying applications modify their own source code as they are executing. So, that would also be taken care by this. We would see how this works after some time. Okay. Uh, let's move to PIN. So PIN is a dynamic binary <coughs> instrumentation image. Uh, engine, it does dynamic binary instrumentation. Uh, it is not free. It is freely available, but it is not open source. You can go to this website, pintool.org, you can download the PIN kit for your OS. Uh, you get a compressed archive, you decompress it, there is nothing to install. Uh, you are, as you decompress, you are ready to use it. It works on x86, 32-bit, and 64-bit platforms and all the major operating systems, Linux, Windows, Mac OS. The Mac OS support is relatively new. I don't know how work it works. Well, it works. Uh, it can instrument unmodified real-life applications like database servers, web servers, web browser, and multi-threaded applications. If you can run an application on any of these operating systems, then you can instrument it. That's OK. So pin, so in pin kit you actually uh, get a binary pin, uh, pin, a binary of the pin instrumentation engine. Okay. So pin instrumentation engine exposes a rich set of APIs. Uh, using this API, you can write in C or C++ your own instrumentation tools. Okay. And these instrumentation tools are called pin tools. There are a lot of sample pin tools provided in with the pin kit. Uh, this is the path name of the, this is the directory in which the sample pin tools are. You should go and look <coughs> them up. So as I told previously that pin is a dynamic binary instrumentation engine. So what it is doing is that it reads the original application code and it is generating some code for this corresponding to this application code. While it is doing this, it uses the information from the pin tool to modify this generation process and it, what it will do, it will insert some extra code which pin tool will tell. Okay? So pin tool will tell where it wants to insert extra code and what code it has to insert. And pin would actually do that for the pin tool. Okay? So pin uses pin tools to instrument applications at runtime during the dynamic binary compilation. And pin tools can be thought of as plugins which modify the code generation process of pin. So, are you clear about the. This tool is a just in time. Just in time compiler. Yes, pin. Yeah. Pin is similar to a just in time compiler. In just in time compiler, you are generating 
machine code corresponding to some byte code. Here you are generating machine code corresponding to. This will also generate at the time uh, the process is executing. Yeah, it will do all these things at <coughs> runtime. When the application is executing, at that point it will be executing the application, and at the same point it will be adding some extra code in the application and executing that extra code also. Okay. So a pin tool consists of instrumentation and analysis routines. Uh, these are simple functions. Uh, instrumentation routines are actually uh, uh, instrumentation routines are called by pin whenever new code has to be generated. Whenever pin is about to generate some new code, it will call it will call these instrumentation routines. Okay. So in an instrumentation, an instrumentation routine actually investigates the static properties of the original code and decides if and where to inject calls to analysis routine. So what it is doing, it, it looks through the code and it decides whether I uh, want to inject some code over here and it will inject calls to analysis routines. Okay? Both of these are contained in the pin tool. Okay? And so once it has decided that it has to insert some uh, call to analysis routine, it will ask pin to insert that call. Okay? So once the code is generated, it is stored in a cache uh, and it would be reused. So if you have a for loop which has some which has some number of iterations, so the first time the, when the first iteration is being executed, at that point pin will generate the code for this for the first iteration. Okay, and while it is generating code for the first iteration, it will instrument it also. So when this first iteration has been executed, the sec for the second iteration. It won't again call the instrumentation routine to generate code because it has already cached that code in the code cache. So this using cache to uh, store the generated code is an optimization with just in time compilers you to reduce this the re reduce the cost of code generation and actually speeds up the process quite much. So uh, just to clarify, this cache is not a hardware structure. Yeah, it's a software cache. Yeah. It's a part of memory. These are for the storing. Storing the. So as long as the generated code is there in the code cache, instrumentation is not required. It can directly execute the code. And <coughs> so if a so for some application code which has already been instrumented, the generated code is present in the code cache. So if that code throughout its lifetime remains in the code cache, the, the instrumentation routine won't be called again for it. So most of the time, this code, the size of code cache is sufficient to cache the whole application. So instrumentation function would only be called for the original code once. Okay. For okay. So these are called at most once for an application. Can you configure the size of the code? Yes. From all line, you can do that. So these are instrumentation and so we were injecting calls to analysis routine. So analysis routine actually defined what the instrumentation code would do. Okay. And so so this is the original application code for this. The generated because we are translating from machine code to machine code, the generated code would also be almost similar to it. So instruction would remain same. The register allocation might differ, but I'm using the same thing. And we have inserted a call to analysis. Okay. okay. So. So this is the original code. We have uh, the pin has generated this code for it, and the pin tool has instrumented this code and injected a call to analysis one function. So each time this compare instruction is about to be executed, just before this compare instruction, this analysis function would also be executed. Okay. So each instruction which has been instrumented, the Analysis functions will be executed each time that instruction is also executed. Okay. Do you get this? So the instrumentation routines are telling you what instruction to instrument. Okay. So you can and where to instrument. Actually. And you can 
put it after instruction, before instruction. Yeah, we will talk about that. Okay, we will talk about that. Yes. And analysis routine is telling you what to do. Do. Okay. So the where and the where and the what here is injecting call to analysis routines, and the where is decided by the instrumentation routine. Okay. So instrumentation means only inserting calls. Yeah. And these are these instrumentation functions will be called at most of the time once for each instruction, and the analysis functions will be called each time that instruction is executed. Okay. So so uh, just one one more comment. So 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 you can see that the instrumentation in the, in the best possible case should be invoked exactly once for each instruction, assuming that you instrument every instruction. Okay, right? So provided of course you have space in code cache and all these things. Whereas analysis routine for a particular instruction will get invoked every time that instruction executes. Because the code has been, uh, so the generated code contains a call to this analysis <coughs> routine. So each time it traverses this code path, this analysis function would be called. Okay. So analysis routine would be called each time it traverses this code. So, so, so a pin tool consists of instrumentation analysis routine, but uh, so pin tool also registers which instrumentation routine pin has to call. Okay. So it registers a callback to the instrumentation routine which pin should be used. And pin tool, so just like it was uh, registering callbacks to in instrumentation routine, pin tool can also register callback <coughs> for notification events. Uh, callbacks to routines for notification events. These notification events can be thread start, thread end, fork of a child process, forking a child process or uh, this can be the application end or uh, image loading and unloading. Here image refers to a library which has been uh, binary file which is being loaded. loaded. Okay. So whenever a binary file for a dynamic library is loaded, uh, we can call a function, we can register a call to a function. Okay. So these are actually, these event notifications are generally used for initializing some part of the pin tool and more for cleanup. Okay. So your pin tool is a C, C++ program. You write it, you compile it, you create a .so file for a library. Is this visible? So you compile it, you get a pin tool .so file and your instrumentation engine is provided with the pin kit. So you, suppl you supply the pin tool to the instrumentation engine as a command line argument and after this double slash you supply the application that you want to instrument. Application binary. The application binary. Okay. <coughs> so these pin tools either you can use the pin kit sample tools or you can write your own. And you can uh, attach pin to a already running process. For that you have to supply the PID of the process with the dash PID <coughs> command line. <coughs> okay. So you're going to give some examples of the pin tool, right? Yeah. After this, there are three examples. Okay, so you get this. How to? So let's look at a. We were we were trying to write a pin tool which actually counts the number of instructions that have been executed. Okay. So the code, the assembly code here, is actually the application's code, and what we want to do is that we want to insert uh, these counter plus plus. Uh, we want to increment the counter when insert code to increment this counter just before each instruction. So whenever uh, this instruction is about to be executed just before it, the counter would be incremented. Okay. So in this way we can maintain the number of instructions that are executed. So just one question. So in that example, that yeah. in most cases we try to inline the analysis function. Right? Yeah. Okay. So it was <coughs> inserting calls to analysis routine. So here our analysis routine would consist of incrementing this counter. But pin can, so we compile this pin tool, so it, it also does compiler optimization. So at there, it, it will see that there's a simple function, so most only it will inline these functions, okay? So this is what we want to do. Okay, suppose that we have written this pin tool, and so we want to instrument ls. So this is what ls normally prints. When we run it with pin like this, this is our tool ins count zero dot so. Okay, I see. So you're running ls in some directory which has these. Yeah, files. which has these files, 
And when we run it with pin, it gives the this is the output from ls, and this is what pin tool will output. Okay, so it will count. It will give us the number of instructions that the ls command is executed. Does everybody follow this this one? Okay. So yeah, this is the pin tool, and by after double slash, this is the binary that we want to instrument. So you're going to show the pin tool? Yeah, for this. Yes. So let's see. So this is. The code for the INS count pin tool. It's a simple C++ <coughs> application, and this is the file in the pin kit in the source tool folder. You can just taken from this file. Okay, so let's see this source code. It has some header files. We include the pin dot h header file because we are going to use the pin API functions. We define this 64-bit uh, integer value. This is the counter which is going to keep the count for number of instructions which is executed, we initialize it to zero. Then we have this do count function which increments this counter by one whenever it is called. Then we have this function instruction. It takes some arguments and this calls this instruction ins insert call function. Okay, so this is a pin API function. Uh, we will talk about these input arguments, but let's see the third argument. The third argument is a pointer to the, this do count function. Okay, so the third argument is a pointer to the do count function. Okay, now the, the other function is the Feeny function. We will talk about what are the input arguments are, and it just prints on the standard uh, STDER the I count value. Okay. In the main function, so this is your pin tool code. In the main function, we have four uh, pin API calls. The first one is pin in it. Uh, then is ins add instrument function. This takes a pointer to the instruction function. So this instruction function is defined over here. Okay. And then there is pin add fini function. This takes a pointer to the Feeny function which is defined in the pin tool. So we are using function pointers quite a lot. Okay, and then there is pin start program. Okay. Now so pin in it actually <coughs> takes a command line argument. You can pass some command line arguments also to the pin tool. So here we are passing the arguments to the pin to initialize the command line arguments and runtime system. But the, can you override the pin init function? No. You, you cannot, right? So you have to always, so your pin tool will all, this would be the first function that your pin tool will execute. This has to be always present. So it's internal, cannot expose. Yeah. You cannot modify. Okay. You can't modify any of these functions. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Now I'm saying you cannot, here at least you can pass a function pointer there, you don't have any freedom at all. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So, ins add instrument function is, so, it takes argument as the so this is our so in IN, through ins add instrument function the pin tool is registering with pin what is the instrumentation routine to call when it is about to generate code okay so this says that whenever pin is about to generate code for an instruction it should first before generating the code it should call the instruction function okay so this is the instruction function is the instrumentation routine. It would be called each time pin is about to generate code. Okay. So let's see what we are doing in the instrumentation function. The instrumentation function takes as input a reference to the instruction for which pin is about to generate code. And the second argument here is the, the argument that is passed here. Okay. So this zero is passed in this. No, so you might also want to mention that that INS prefix. Yeah, I would. Okay, you are about to. <laughs> so <coughs> this is registering whenever pin is about to generate code for an instruction, it should call this instruction function before that. And the second argument here is this uh, this zero. So we do not use this much. So most of the time it would be zero. Okay. Now let's see what it, what we are doing inside the ins instrumentation function. Here we are calling this in ins insert call function. Here we are re so we want to insert uh, call to this 
we want to incre increment the counter at each before each instruction. Okay. So we are saying that before this instruction, we want to uh, we are asking pin to insert a call to this do count function before the, before it generates before the before the code for this instruction. Okay. That's the second argument. This is the. Uh, <laughs> to that. No, you just mentioned before, that's why I'm saying. <coughs> so we will talk about this I point before, so leave it for now, and this I R again, we will talk about these. Okay. So INS insert call is saying, asking pin to inject a call to do count function before it generates code for this INS function. Okay. So this instruction function can be called anytime. No. This instruction function is the instrumentation function. It will be called by pin whenever pin is about to generate code for an instruction. Okay. So, so suppose that pin is about to generate code for this compare instruction. Okay. So before generating code for it, pin will call the instruction function. The instruction function says that uh, insert a call uh, before the before you generate code for this function. To insert a call to this do count function. Okay. So call do count and then pin will generate code for this instruction. So this. Yeah. So how does it know when to call this function? You're saying before uh, doing instrumentation, but how does it know when to do instrumentation? Uh, I've, I've, that is, I can no, but that INS prefix isn't it telling it that you should do this for every instruction? Yeah, I, I would come to that. I'm saying that INS instrument add function is saying that whenever it is about to generate code for an instruction, yeah, it okay. should call this instruction function first and this instruction function is the instrumentation <coughs> function it is asking pin to insert a call inject a call to do count function just before uh, it it generates code for this this particular instruction okay you any doubt see so can i say this function after the instruction instrument this code? Another function after each instruction to another code. Uh, yeah, I did not get it. So you you have have yes, you can have as many instrumentation functions. So you can have another instrumentation function which may be inserting call to some other analysis routine. Okay. So you can insert call to the second analysis routine here only. Okay. You can do you can do another INS insert call, some do count to But I want to add this call to a specific function. Add this call to a specific function. So you are saying that suppose that when, whenever printf is being called, yeah, yeah, you can. So uh, till now we are not analyzing what this instruction is. This instruction may be uh, called to printf. We would anal We can even analyze that. I will come to that. Okay. So this is just introducing what instrumentation and analysis routines are. And how <coughs> do you understand this? So the uh, just one comment here is that. Uh, so the do count is the analysis routine. Okay. Now let's focus on this pin add fini function. Okay. Uh, before that. So this is your instrumentation point. In the next slide I will talk about what instrumentation point is and this is your end argument to the insert call. We'll come to that also. Okay. So that's a marker, is it? IR yeah. No that's a marker. Okay. Okay, now so I told you previously that pin can also register callbacks to uh, event for <coughs> events. Okay. Callbacks to routine for events. So pin at Fini is registering a callback for Fini function whenever the application is about to exist. So it registers a callback for application and event. Whenever the application is about to exit, it will call this Fini function. Okay. So that's what we want to do. Whenever the application is about to exit, we would print the number of instructions that have executed. Okay. So this function just prints count and uh, instructions that have executed. Is it abnormal at that point? Yeah, at that point also this will be gone. Yeah, so you can use this function for any other purpose. Whatever you want to do at, at termination, essentially. So in this case, so we are just taking a count. Yeah. Here we were yes. counting number of instructions, so we just print the count. I mean, you may have allocated some uh, exactly. memory for your pin tool. 
you may free it at application end. Okay. So these event functions are generally for uh, uh, initializing and clean up at the end. So here I could use cout also or is there a problem? Yeah, you can use cout also. I have not included using okay, so instrumentation. And the last call essentially uh, gets you started. Right? Okay. So when this function, so here we were initializing the runtime system. Here we just registered with pin to call this instruction function when it is about to do instrumentation. And in, in this pin add Fini function, we, we were registering a call to the Fini function when it is about to end. And pin, so till this point the application has not started, neither has the instrumentation. And when we do pin start program, so this function never returns actually. Okay. So this return zero is just for compilers. It's a, it's a long job, isn't it? Yeah. So this return is just to make the compiler happy. This never returns. So that one is a long job. Yeah. Okay. And it basically when this function executes, it starts the application and starts the instrumentation process. Okay. So these two functions would always be there in your pin tool and you would add instrumentation routines and notification routines. Okay. Now let's come into the instrumentation point. So if you remember that here the second argument was the instrumentation point. Okay. So this insert call was taking the instruction reference as one of the first input, then an instrumentation point, and the third argument was the analysis routine. Okay. So the instruction point actually uh, uh, it refers to a position relative to the instruction. So if we look at this JLE instruction, so there are three positions. So so the so it says, so whenever we are inserting call to uh, analysis routine, so we can say whether we want to insert call to analysis routine before this function, before this instruction or after this instruction. Okay. So before this instruction, so we give, we had in the last example, we had given I point before. Okay. So it will insert the call to do count function over here. Okay. Corresponding to this JLE instruction. The after, after it there are two positions because this is a branch instruction. The fall through edge, the fall through edge follows is the next instruction in the source, and the <coughs> target uh, is this edge is called the uh, taken edge. Okay, so for the fall through edge we could use I point after, and for the taken edge we can use I point taken branch. Okay, so. If here we would have given I point after, then what would have happened is that if we can go to this, okay. If we have given I point after, then this counter plus plus would have come here, okay. It would have been inserted here. Okay. Okay. So this is clear to everybody. So this this is a problem only with branches. Does anybody see that? Okay. So yeah, yeah. After a branch, there could be two possibilities depending on which way the branch goes. Okay, so so both of these may not be even defined for some instructions. So if this is an unconditional jump, okay, so there is no fall through edge after it. Okay. So because it will always jump, so I point fall through edge, I point after is not valid if this is a conditional branch. Unconditional branch. Only uh, the taken edge is valid. Or so or if this is not a compare, if it is not a branch instruction, like this is a compare instruction, there is no uh, taken edge here. Okay, there is only fall through edge here. So these two may not be defined for each instruction, but I point before is always defined for an instruction. So Most of the in the previous example, yes, sir. instead of I point before, I specify I point after. Yeah. Will so that may so it will compile correctly, right? Yeah, it will compile correctly, but so it will not be able to count the taken branches. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That would so you would have to actually somehow <coughs> modify your instrumentation code. So now what if I specify both? Yes, yeah, you would have to specify both. So in that case, will there be double counting for non-branch instruction? No, right? Uh, no, okay. because the other part does not exist. So you understand what servers say? Suppose that in this example here, 
we do not want to insert call be at before the instruction. We want to insert it after the instruction. So if we give only I point after, okay. So what may happen is that for conditional branches, I mean this counter plus plus won't would never be executed if the branch is taken. For conditional branches, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. For for conditional branches, if the branch is taken, then the counter plus plus which is just after it won't be executed. So we would insert the counter plus plus on both these parts, I point after and the taken branch. So maybe I should clarify one thing. We talked about this branch delay slot last time. Next sense it doesn't have anything of that sort. It's a bit specific thing. So here there is no delay slot. Okay. Just to be very clear. So most of the time we would be using I point before, but some for branch predictor study we may have to uh, right. use these also. Use these. Okay. So for example, if you if you want to know, uh, just you know, give it a branch. How many times you take the fall through? How many times you take the taken path? Right? Then these two will be very important. Otherwise, you can of course use. I, I mean, point. we can even do that with I point. point yeah, right. Yes, yes. So at I point, yeah, I would. Yeah, we will it off. So now let's look another example. So this here we want to print the instruction trace. Okay. So <coughs> by instruction trace, I mean the instruction address for the instructions which are executed. So we would insert a call to this print IP function and we will supply an input argument as IP. Okay. So here we need to pass an input argument to the analysis routine. In the previous case we were not passing any input arguments. Okay. So, so in the, uh, just one clarification, uh, just about background. So in the Intel world, IP refers to instruction, instruction point, the same as program counter. Okay. Right. So it is just printing the instruction pointer of every instruction, this particular. Okay, so this tool also works in a similar fashion. This is how we will use it, itrace.so. Okay, we will write a program, itrace.cpp for it. We will compile it, get itrace.so. And it will, so it is just printing, the, it is not outputting anything on the standard output or error terminal. It basically writes in this itrace.out file, this print tool. So when you run it, it will, it will create this itrace.out file and this I am showing some part of the itrace.out. So it will print the instruction addresses and etc. So the first four instructions? Yes, yeah, first four instructions. Well, first four instruction addresses. Yeah. Okay. IP is internal to pin, pin the pin value. Print IP. Print IP is the instruction pointer which pin will provide. It will manage, it will compute IP, it will keep instruction pointer somehow. And print IP is the function we would analysis function that we would supply. So okay. here, just one minute. Go back to the trace. Uh, so the first instruction is one byte, is it? Nineteen ninety one. Uh, yeah. First instruction is one byte. Second one and is pretty large. Three, three byte. Second one is pretty large, actually. Right. Nine one eight four. Yeah. This may be a jump. <coughs> This could be a job. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So x86 instructions are not of the same size. Yeah. They are variable size instructions. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to say whether it's a jump or yeah. Okay. So this is the code for IDRIS. This is also taken from the sample rules. Okay. So here the analysis routine is print IP. So it is taking an input argument IP okay. and it is just printing the uh, this as IP. Okay. The, the here this code is almost same except that we are creating a file itrace.i <coughs> when the program starts and in the Feeny we are just closing this file. Okay. Uh, okay. And the instrumentation registration is almost same, the Feeny is almost same. So look at the instrumentation function. This has changed. So here we have some more arguments. We are passing some other arguments to the this INS insert call function. We are passing IR instruction pointer. Okay. So this is the these are so what would happen? What I here we are saying that so 
we are asking pin to insert a inject a call to print ip function and we are asking it to pass ir instruction pointer as a input to the print ip function okay so it will yeah. ir instruction pointer is a is defined by the pin api it actually gives you the instruction for the current instruction what whatever it is instrumenting okay it's a global environment variable, isn't it? Uh, uh, can I tell you? No, it is a, it's a void strut type. It has to be right. For, uh, yeah. Is it? Uh, and for example, yes, sir. In main, can I access it? IR instruction pointer? In main? Yeah. No. Okay. So this is kind of a, uh, I would say, hash defined. Oh, so, I see. Okay, that is fine. Okay. Anyway, okay. So, so I'm just thinking that it just gets. This is a short form. I mean, I would. Okay. So basically, pin provides a API function ins address to that function. Okay. If you provide the instruction reference as an input, it will give you the address. It's a macro. Yeah, it is a macro. A macro. IR instruction pointer is a macro, okay. and it is just saying that inject a call to print IP function and give this instruction pointer as an input to it. Okay. So this analysis function can have any number of arguments. Yeah, this analysis, so analysis function can have any number of arguments. And we can, so in the INS insert call, we specify what all arguments we want to pass. The first three arguments to these always, most of the time are same. The first one is the instruction. The second one is the instrumentation point. The third one is the analysis function that we want to inject. And after the analysis function, we can specify any number of arguments we want to pass to the print IP analysis function and IR end actually is a macro which specifies the end of the uh, arguments to INS insert call. Okay. So whatever is between print IP and IR end would be passed as input to print IP function. For example, if I wanted to pass a file pointer, this will make me lower. Yeah, you can, that, right? yeah, you can do that. Okay. So yeah, if I define file pointer over here, it <coughs> will be available to this. I, I open it within instruction, let's say. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and then pass it. So, yeah, you can do, do that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, is this clear? Yeah. So, example of arguments to analysis routine. So, we can pass our integer value. So, we can, we could have written, so, I have not shown the, So this is what INS instrumentation. This is the INS instrument. So these three arguments are still almost the same. Uh, if we want to pass a 32-bit uh, integer value to this function as an input, we could say uh, IR UN32, and then we could uh, say some uh, six. So what this is saying is that uh, it is used like this. So these macros, uh, some of these, so this IN32 macro is not supplied alone, just like IR. It is supplied with a value. Okay. So you have to give the value also with it. So you give UN32 and then the value after a comma, the value. So it will pass the value 6 as a 32-bit integer value to the uh, analysis function. So yeah. It can be a variable also, right? Yeah. It need not be a constant. Yeah, it can be a variable also. So it's typecasting, right? That's the yeah. problem. Okay. So it is type one. So, so this is just the type of, okay? And IR instruction point is a macro. It is actually so transformed into IR UN32, INS address instruction, okay? And there are others. So we can also pass register values to functions. I have not shown examples for this, but IR register value and then the register name. So pin would pass the value of that register. Okay, and we can pass the branch target address. So this is also a macro. It will get the branch instruction from the instruction, uh, the branch target address from the instruction, and it will pass it as a 32-bit 
uh, it will pass it as an instruction value to the function. Okay? And we can even pass memory addresses. We would see example how to use them further. And there are many more. You can pass any number of arguments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that stop now? There is one more example that I Okay. Okay. So till now we have been instrumenting. Uh, we have been inserting code at just at each instruction. Okay. So if you want to do a uh, cache simulation. Okay or we want to print the memory trace. So we want to insert code uh, to print, so suppose that we are doing memory, printing a memory trace, okay? So we want to insert just before each load store instruction, not before a ALU instruction, okay? We want to insert code specific to some instruction. So instrument- yeah, probably uh, tell me what a memory trace is first. You will not know. Okay. Just a sequence of, yeah. So this is the memory trace. So this is the instruction address. So this instruction PC value and the memory trace is saying that this instruction did a read from this memory address. Okay. So similarly this instruction did a write on this memory address. So this is the memory trace. So we want to collect this memory trace. Okay. And so till now we were instrumenting at each instruction. but if we can collect memory trace through that mechanism also, but that would be inefficient. There are a lot of, almost one, two third of the instructions are non-memory instructions. We do not want to instrument those, okay? We want to instrument only the instructions which are, uh, which are load store instructions, okay? So this tool, pinner trace, does that, prints the memory trace. It is also there in the pin kit. And this is the code for it. So it uh, Kind of way. Do you want to take it up next time? So I have put a link to pay to on the course website. You can download and start playing with it if you want. There are many. Yeah, this is the website for print. Yeah, it's, print. it's linked up with the course website also. Uh, there is a manual there on the website. Uh, all these examples have been taken from that manual. It's kind of a tutorial. Okay. You should go through that tutorial. So we'll finish this up next time. So this is a concise tutorial for you. Once we are done, we'll post the first homework.